What else can we learn about the last week of Jesus in Jerusalem? That's what we're going to find out today in Luke 23. All right, we have Luke 23 and Luke 24, and then we head into John. We're going to see another take at Jesus last week in Jerusalem. These three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are what we call synoptic Gospels. And that means that they are synchronized with our eyes. We can see that they are very similar stories. Most people feel, again, that Mark was the basis for Matthew and Luke, and that each of the other two added their own flavors to the stories, Mark being the account that Peter gave to Mark while they were traveling in Rome. Matthew, again, was for the Jewish people to explain all the prophecies and how it was coming about and how they were fulfilled in Jesus. Mark was trying to tell the action Jesus story to Romans who weren't going to sit through a lot of uh, history and a lot of prophecy and stuff like that. And then Luke, again, we're talking to Gentiles, and sometimes Gentiles also could include Hellenized Jews, which means that they weren't very Jewish sometimes. Sometimes they were, but just basically people who, I guess, the Jewish structure didn't consider to be Jewish. So you might even think of tax collectors or something like that in that list. So we're finishing up that particular story. And so from each of these points of view, we're trying to explain an aspect of Jesus. It doesn't make the other ones wrong. It doesn't make the other ones in conflict. It means it's from the point of view of a specific look at it. And just like if you and I were to sit down and write a book about the Acapulco sunset as we're sitting on the beach watching it, we would have different points of view. You talk about the colors and the hues and the sound of the ocean. And I would talk about the seashells and the children running up and down the beach. We would all get different things out of that same experience. And I think that's what we're seeing here. We start out Luke 23 with Jesus being brought before Pilate. The rabbis are like, this man's misleading people. He's telling us that we shouldn't give tribute to Caesar, which is not anything Jesus said. This is all baloney, right? And Pilate says, were you the king of the Jews? And Jesus is very chill and is like, you said so. And Pilate said to the chief priest, I don't find this man guilty of anything. I I don't think that there's a problem here. This guy was a real threat. He would be dressed in robes. He would say, all right, Pilate, bow down before me. He was doing none of that. This man was dressed in plain clothes. He was not assuming to be the king of Rome, the king of the Judean Empire. Probably to Pilate, either he meant something entirely different or he was just a crackpot. And in Matthew, we find out his wife is even dreaming about not punishing this man. According to tradition, Claudia was the granddaughter of Caesar Augustus through an illicit affair. He legitimized her. They believe she spoke up at the trial of Jesus, that later she became a Christian. Again, not biblical, just tradition. The goal is keeping Jerusalem and the entire district calm, not trying to upset people. But if he knew some people liked him and some people didn't, there's no problem with that. I mean, probably John the Baptist was in the same way. Some people liked him, some people didn't. What's the big deal here? I don't think Pilate cared. I think he just cared to keep the peace. But the uh, temple structure, as we saw many times, and we'll see it again in John, are winding up. They were disgruntled. They were challenging him. They were trying to trick him. Finally, they had it with him. And then plots came to kill him. And that's where we're going to next. So now they're just finally like, we've had it. We've, we've done this before. This is the Sanhedrin that had 71 people, high priest who was the president, and then a lot of elder priests. And it says the teachers of the law, those are going to be the Pharisees, and then they all get together. And so they're discussing this, but they had all the power when it came to what was going on in the religious lives, in their own tax system, because they were taxing for the temple, but they weren't allowed to kill anybody. So that's why they haul them before Pilate, because Only Pilate and the Romans could actually put someone to death. Romans don't want any hubbub. And so if you get someone religiously upset, they didn't care about the Jewish faith. They didn't care about any of that. They had their own faith. Maybe they were interested. Maybe they were intrigued. I read somewhere that said that the Romans and the Greeks thought that the Jewish faith was very old and backwards. They're the modern faith (laughs) to speak of because they're newer and They're vibrant. We take on gods all the time. And look how exciting we are. So in the end, they probably didn't care about any of this. But 
They wanted to make sure the peace is kept. They probably didn't like the Sanhedrin much, but it was a structure that Herod, who was in league with the Romans, built to keep everything tight and to keep everything under, I don't know, under control. And there, it says that they're urgent now. So they're upset. They're trying to, to raise the temperature. He stirs up people teaching throughout Judea, from Galilee to even this place. Here in Jerusalem, our big city, fancy place. He's doing this everywhere. So Pilate hears that and he's like, okay, well, if this man's from Galilee, this is Herod's jurisdiction. He's not my problem. Send him to Herod. And was also happens to be in Jerusalem. Again, this is Passover time. So everyone is going to be in Jerusalem. This is going to be the happening place. Herod saw Jesus and says he was very glad because he had a desire to see him. He had heard about him. I guess we saw in other things. He was a little bit unsure if this was John the Baptist coming back from the dead. But if you've got a hubbub in town, you certainly want to see what's going on and see if this was the person he put his head on the platter. It says that he questioned him at some length, but Jesus didn't answer. The chief priests and scribes stood by making these accusations. Herod, with his soldiers, because he has his own soldier group, treated with contempt, mocked him. They put, put him in the splendid clothing, sent him back to Pilate again. And Herod and Pilate, it says, became friends that very day for him because they had just liked each other in the past, but now they had to work on this together. We cannot just put someone popular to death, even if the temple structure is against him, because this is going to rile people up. And so we have to be as one with this and come out with a, like a solid message. It reminds me if you would see two gangsters suddenly who fought their whole lives suddenly becoming friends because they want one person dead. Then Pilate calls together chief priests and the people, the rulers of the people, that's going to be the temple structure. And it says, you brought this guy to me who was misleading the people, and I didn't find him guilty of anything. Neither did Herod, really. So he sent him back to us. Nothing looks that bad. And so I'm just going to punish and then release him. But let's just be done with this whole thing. Because putting someone to death, if it's some, I don't know, random dude he's flying on a country road somewhere, or we've heard of other places where the Romans put people to death. The, the Galileans that were, I don't know what they were doing, put them to death. They're nobodies. But the, this guy's popular. I mean, kind of like John the Baptist was popular. We have to be careful here. So let's just punish him, tell him he was a bad guy, and then set him on his way. Tell him to stop doing what he was doing. So I got a little confused at this point because I'm like, well, wait a minute. Which of Herod's kids is this? So there was Herod Archelaus, and when King Herod the Great died, Archelaus was born in 23 BC, and so he was the person who was going to take over the power. And he ruled until 6 AD after uh, Herod the Great died, and Caesar Augustus uh, Octavian removed him. So Archelaus was not very different from his father, but didn't do as good of a job. And Josephus writes a lot about Archelaus. And so then we have Antipas. And Antipas had been, it said, removed from his father's will shortly before he died. Part of that was Antipas is the Herod that we talk about at the end of Jesus' life. He was also the son of Herod the Great. Antipas just became known as Herod. He was born somewhere at 20 BC, died somewhere at 39 BC. And he's, of course, the brother of Archelaus, who ruled Judea until after his father's death, Augustus, it said, recognized Antipas, and he's supposed to rule Galilee. Like, they sort of split up the kingdom. Because Herod the Great, he's pretty great. But these guys, not so great. So we're going to carve up the kingdom a little bit in order for us to kind of give them each a little bit. So it was Galilee and uh, sort of east of the Jordan River, some areas over there. And sometimes he's called Herod the Tetrarch. Or King Herod, he was not a king. Rome would not let him be, but he thought of himself as a king. The dude that killed John the Baptist, he died somewhere around 39 AD. We're going to find out about another Herod. This is going to be Herod Agrippa and Herod Agrippa the second or the two, whatever. And we'll talk about them later as we get into other parts of the New Testament. So Pilate was, again, appointed by the Roman government. He was there to keep the peace. He probably 
usually lived in Caesarea. I also heard that he was in a fortress in Antonia, which is just north of the temple. So probably two places he lived. And again, his goal is just to keep the peace on everything. You don't get to be a leader for being garbage. So he must have done a fairly good job. But Israel is kind of a backwater place. What's it to be the ruler or the governor of the most backwater place in the empire? It's, it's not great. So this is his chance, if he does a good job, to move up into the eh, view of Augustus. Like I said, I just wanted to go over that because I know I got very confused about which Herod we were talking about. And I just wanted to make sure that I had the right one. But then they all said, pried out together, away with this man, release us to Barabbas, bar Abbas, which means son of the father. We had the literal son of the father, but we had some guy who was a criminal, an insurrectionist who wanted for murder, also named Barabbas. I believe that's factually true, but you also have to think of it from a philosophical point of view. We're released. Jesus is sent to the cross for our sins. Pilate said, well, we could release Jesus, right? And everyone's like, no, crucify him. Everyone's screaming. And so now, again, Pilate's like, oh boy, I don't want to rile up the people. So why? What did he do? I have not seen anything that is punishable by death. But again, they got more and more urgent. There was indication in the other gospels that the chief priest and the temple structure was riling people up and among the crowd, making them scream. And it says their voices prevailed. So Pilate says, okay, well, fine. he's going to meet the demands. And so the man was thrown in prison. Barabbas is going to be let go. But Jesus, they're going to hand him over to their will, which the will was killing him. It seems like he tried to do what he could because, again, he just didn't see the need to kill Jesus. But we also know that on the other side, Jesus has to be killed to save us from our sins. So this is going to happen. We knew how this was going to end. I found myself when watching uh, some of the movies about the resurrection that portrayed it. Every time I came to this point, I was like, Jesus, go do it. Let Jesus go. Then we're in trouble if Jesus is let go. Then the whole price of our sins aren't paid. So they let him away and they seized Simon of Cyrene. We talked about him before. Cyrene was in Africa and Simon came from another country. They laid the cross on him to carry it behind Jesus. Jesus was probably beaten, abused at this point, broken down, could no longer carry the cross. So Simon of Cyrene also carried the cross for Jesus too. What does Jesus say? Carry the cross and follow me. Well, that's what Simon did. And Jesus said, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and your children, talking to the women. The days are coming where you'll say you're blessed to be barren. And for women who never had children, they'll begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, to the hills, cover us. Because if they do these things when the wood is green, what happens when it's dry? I mean, this is meaning tough times are coming and you are going to be glad at that time that you're not going to, I don't know, witness horrible things for your children. So the other criminals were also there. They were led away with him and they came to the place of the skull. In, in Latin, it's Calvary, in, which would be Roman, and in Hebrew, it's Golgatha. There are two places. One of them is Protestant and one of them is Catholic, and they all fight about where this is. But the idea is that we believe that it was on a very public street because they wanted crucifixions to be very public. See what happens when you mess around with Rome? This is what you get. People stood by watching, and Jesus just says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's ESV. And the rulers were scoffing and someone said, well, if he's the Christ, he's the chosen one, let him save himself. Through this whole time, we have heard people challenge Jesus, mock Jesus, telling them ridiculous stories about a woman with seven husbands. This is just more of it. They are just being awful, being awful even up to the very end. And so the soldiers were also mocking him. And it said they offered him a sour wine. We talked about that before. Chances are this wine, first of all, it's sour. Ugh. I mean, you're already having a bad day, but it probably also had uh, some medication, some sort of uh, opium in it that would dull the pain. And Jesus did not want to do that. There's an inscription over him that says this is King of the Jews. That's that initials I-N-R-I you see on the top of many crosses. It, this is mocking, but this is the king of the whole world. 
This was the king of everybody. It says that one of the criminals who was hanged railed at him. Why can't you save us and yourself? And they start yelling at him. Don't you fear God? You're under the same place we are. We're horrible people. You're here with us getting the same punishment we are. So they're just scorning him too. I mean, just these rotten criminals that are next to him. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. I think this is so powerful because this means up to the very end, we wonder what we must do in order to get to the kingdom of God. Nothing. This guy wasn't baptized. This guy didn't live a holy life. This guy, at the very moment, asked Jesus to remember him. His faith turned to Jesus at that last moment, even though he was scorning him the minute before. The important thing to know, it's never too late to to come to God and ask for forgiveness and to be saved. The sixth hour, Jesus died. Darkness was over the land until the ninth hour. So three hours, the sun, it said the sunlight failed. The curtain was torn in two. There were two curtains technically in the temple. We can talk about the meaning of it. One is that there's no longer, the one I heard, no separation between God and man anymore. Other people said this means this is the end of the temple. There's there's nothing here anymore. Jesus is now our temple. And so this is over with. Jesus calls out, it says in a loud voice, Father, into my hands I commit my spirit. And he breathed his last. Centurion saw what happened. He praised God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. Wow, the first person. This is amazing. We saw before, too, that he called him, surely this man must be the Messiah. There was a crowd assembled for the spectacle. We've seen that in old Wild West movies or places where crowds come to see a hanged man. When they saw what happened, it said they were beating their breasts. That's a sign of mourning or lamenting. And it says all his acquaintances and the women who who followed him from the very beginning from Galilee just stood there watching at a distance. We don't know if they were disappointed and they just couldn't even bear to see it. It, We don't know if it was dangerous for them because now the Romans are going to come looking for them. So we don't really know why they were standing at a distance, but they were. Then it said that a man, Joseph of Arimathea, there's a town called Arimathea, was a member of the Sanhedrin council, and it says a good and righteous man who did not consent to their decision. He was not on board for this. He went to Pilate and asked for the body. Usually people, the family would take it or it would be abandoned and thrown into a pit, something like that. But it had to come down before Sabbath. This was important because if it, sunset on Sabbath, while the body was still up there, it would be left there. So he hurried, he got permission for the body, took it down, wrapped it in linen, and it said laid it in a cut stone where no one had ever been laid. We found out in other gospels that this is his own tomb because he's a wealthy man. He has his own tomb all ready to go for when he and his family die. It says it was a day of preparation for, and the Sabbath was beginning. And the women who came with him from Galilee, Jesus came with him from Galilee, saw the tomb and how his body was laid, and they returned to prepare the spices and the ointment. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandments. So that is the end of 23. We have the death and burial of Jesus and the entire trial. This was a very quick review of this entire trial. Luke's point is about Jesus the Messiah. Jesus, the Messiah, everybody. Jesus, the man who saves everybody's soul and cares for everybody. And this resurrection is very important. We know that Jesus went out forgiving people. We know that Jesus went out as the king, that he is the one who gave up his life and said it was finished. But what was finished? Was it just his life or was it this path? That was set out from the very beginning to pay for our sins. So what I'm going to meditate on this week is the fact of this paying for our sins and this price that was paid. A lot of times non-Christians will say, if Jesus was really a son of God, why did he do this to his own son? He could just say, I forgive everyone's sins. 
and be done. But the idea of justice, I, I saw something today where a woman was killed, a real amazing woman. She just finished medical school and she was killed. And it said the family was demanding justice. We call out for justice. We lament in this world about how there's no justice in the world, which means justice is people who commit crimes and never paying for those crimes. The crime has to be paid for, and Jesus is paying for that crime. But we also know about forgiveness, and Jesus gave the perfect forgiveness too. What I'm going to pray about is that I always remember how hard this is and opportunities there were to get away from this. The devil offered Jesus a way out. Jesus could have just escaped into the desert and never gone into Jerusalem. But Jesus knew this had to happen. And he set the axe in motion and went out to fulfill what was supposed to happen from the beginning of time. And what I'm going to share with others is the fact that a huge price was paid. When we think think of sin, what they call a cheap redemption, something like that, I can just sin and I can go ask God for forgiveness. You are throwing shade on the heavy price that was paid to pay for those sins. To make light of it, to make light of our sins is to make light of this cost. Our sin is so costly. This is what had to happen in order to pay for our sins. All right, Owen, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. We will finish up Luke in the next episode. Please remember that you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd love to hear from you and what topics are on your mind, either for this podcast or Small Steps with God. You can find this one at thebibleinsmallsteps.com or the other podcast, smallstepswithgod.com. If you're wanting to hear something, let me know. I would love to talk about it. <music>